Right then. I have no desire to watch my own face appear. Never any desire to watch my own face appear, but I do like to be able to watch all the chats, so I've got that up right. Hello, Jay Rishon. Hello, Michael. Hello, Primac. Hello, Jack. Hello, Raphael. Hello, Blue Shit Buddha. Hi, Jay. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Ian. Gordon. These Newts. Jim Neaton and Stephanie. Hi, Greg, as well. Let's see. Is this working? Do I look the size of a house? Probably. I just took my dog for a walk in the hot sun. It's glorious sunshine, but it does make you go... Oomph. Right. So today's going to be a little bit sort of different than the normal ones because, well, A, I've done most of the videos, but not all of them. Uh, I've done two out of three. The third one will come. It is a brightly coloured shirt. And I'm going to start off by talking about the people who haven't had a video yet. Uh, this is the tank shirt. Now, I'm wearing the tank museum shirt because I have been looking at all the stuff the tank museum have been doing on Twitter with videos, and they just don't get enough praise. Um, let's put it this way. I've been doing a lot of work today. Okay, just, just, just you know. Slowly. These are the glass bottles. This is the Special Iron Brew, which... Honestly, I'm too cheap to really buy myself, but my lovely girlfriend does send to me. Um, so, uh, occasionally, as a nice sort of treat, and this way, it stops me having to sort of... Uh, this uh, is... I keep track of that. Right, I'm just going to deal with a couple of things which keep popping up on the phone. I keep having some very nice people are trying to chat me. Notifications. Okay. Right. Hopefully that's still working. I do apologise for that close-up view of my face. It was probably quite disturbing to all of you. <laughs> uh, that, uh, Daniel, there is always much love for the special iron brew. Did everyone get their homework done? Two were excellent, and I can't wait for the third. Well, the third one is coming. It's sort of a case of this morning I've had to cover a lecture which was supposed to be done but wasn't able to be done by someone else. Then we had the recording of episode three of Bilge Pumps, which we do every Tuesday morning. So every Tuesday morning, well, for me and Jack, it's Tuesday morning. For uh, Jamie, it's I suppose Tuesday evening, maybe Monday evening. I'm not quite sure. Um, we get together and we have our chat and we have a nice long discussion. And the thing is about this nice long discussion, it does go on for a while, <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> so starting off with the third video, because the reason I started off and wanted to talk about the third, what would have been the third video, and people from the third video first, is because I realise I talk a bit about Max Horton in the first video where I'm talking about Percy Noble. And that can cause me to get into a lot of trouble because there are lots of, quite rightly, he is a submariner who achieves very high office very quickly. Now, <laughs> um, yes, I'll just answer the poodle question. Danny Freeman, yes, I have a full-size standard poodle, a uh, party one, called the Fl uh, who is we called on here the Fluffy Research Assistant. Hello, Perry. Right. Uh, Blue Shed Butter. It's episode two of the Bilge Pumps up and available. It'll be up and available tomorrow. That's the joyous thing. We record it on a Tuesday. It goes out the following Wednesday. Because of the way things work. And it's just, it works out that way. So it will come out tomorrow. Um, right. 
so the reason I want to talk about Max Horton is because he is one of those things he's a difficult one to talk about in that you can either sit there and go, everything is down to him. This is water I'm finishing off quickly. Or you say he comes in and takes over from what Percy Noble set up. I think it's a bit of a two because honestly, Percy Noble sets up all these these things and gets everything running very, very well. And then Max Horton comes in at the point that there starts to be more escorts available. Yes, the U-boats get tougher to deal with, but he's got more escorts and he's got all the processes in place and he can run these things. I have to say, my we uh, the weakness I was put for him is that he loves golf so much. Um, seriously, in, in pretty much every day, because so much of the Atlantic battles take place at night. Every day he goes for a um, golf game. I seem to remember one of the jokes is he's a financial eight put on Wikipedia, but on other ones I've seen he's a financial twelve in some books. So his golf game really isn't that great, which suggests perhaps he was practicing all the time in the submarine. Not a good place to practice golf. Uh, Kelly Harley, uh, uh, have admirals, any admirals ever taken a fleet out onto the high seas for short time to test their eyesight? Okay, I don't tend to like to dive into politics, but no, they don't tend to do that. You know. Anyway, Stephen White. Trying to read about William White. Relation? Hmm, maybe not. But um, he did get away from the master. He did. Yes, he did. Uh, Carl Gunn, how easy is it to find a book on Casper John? Well, for me, it's very easy. It's in my bookshelf. <laughs> but seriously, um, you can find it. Its ISBN number is 0-00-217136-0. And I found it on Amazon when I was looking last night. So it is on there. Because I was trying to check that I wasn't sending any of you on wild goose chases on books you can't find. I did look at A Books. I looked at Amazon. And everyone I couldn't find on A Books I could still find on Amazon. Sometimes for quite extortionate prices. So you might want to think about them. But Casper Jolm one I could find for quite reasonable prices on Amazon and A Books. Dan from golf as opposed to bowls like Raleigh. Yes, well, that's the thing. That was his methodology. He was relaxing by playing golf. And it was a good time for him. Um, he has several other issues in terms of his command style that get him into some sort of trouble. He has a habit of commanding from a distance and wanting to be further away, which is kind of at odds with his traditional career because his career was, you know, he was quite famous. Um, he's known for, uh, you know, the use. Max Horton is the guy who started a tradition where Royal Navy submarines fly a Jolly Roger when they've managed to come in from a successful cruise and they've sunk an enemy. Um, most recently, of course, HMS Conqueror flew a Jolly Roger when she came in in 1982. Um, I'm sure, politically, they're supposed to have got rid of those Jolly Rogers. I'm fairly sure every single submarine still has them. Uh, <laughs> that's the submarine service. They're not PC, they're good guys. <sighs> Schleppy 42, not you. no, you're not late. <laughs> no, um, I have to say... I keep these bottles as mementos. They're sort of my, my trophies of how many of the glorious, good quality iron brew I have drunk. <laughs> right. So, Max Horton is an interesting officer and an interesting admiral. And before I get into any other rambles, any questions from the earlier videos? Anything you would like me to sort of go back quickly into? I finished the water. I was good. 
Now I can have the iron brew. Basically, I came back from walking a dog, so I had some water first. I was being healthy-ish. <laughs> Any recommendations on town class, aka HMS Edinburgh? Well, that's slightly off topic, but actually I can. I, I don't mind doing that one because Edinburgh is always a fun one to do. And... <laughs> Well, this is for HMS Manchester, and I do somewhere have the equivalent book on HMS Edinburgh, but I honestly can't see it around me at the moment. But of course, sitting behind me is always this one, which is very good on the town class. So Neil McCart on the town class generally, and this is Richard Osborne's book on HMS Manchester. I wonder where the Edinburgh one's got to. Sometimes. Ah, Vladimir Vuchtov. Yes. I can do something about Vladimir. Easily talk about Vladimir. And actually, that's part of the sort of sessions. So... Let me just check I'm spelling it correctly. Yeah. Always misspelling. I'm trying to look up a picture of him for everyone. Um, right. Now. Not sure how well you'll be able to see the picture, but it's taken from the Wikipedia page which we found. Now, Vukovic on, Norm on Normandy and various other things was obsessed with high speed. He thought that he could get them as fast as they could do. And he did quite well in it. Trouble is, when you have an obsession with speed and you're building a cruise liner, you tend to build something which is quite uncomfortable. So, you start everyone that sort of, you know, he starts trying to do things which can go speed and comfort and balance the speed and comfort. And he can also come up with some quite interesting ideas. Not really a mili much of a military designer, though, and I have to say I'm stronger on the military ones. Now, let's get into them. Um, Michael Sanderson. Was it Noble or Horton that set up Watu, or was that someone else? It was Noble who set up Watu. Uh, no, let me, let me put it. Noble who wrote up and got the got stuff going for Watu, and then Horton who was there when it was set up so he could uh, set a, uh, claim credit and go, yay, it's been set up. It's been working in the process for the last 12 months, but you know, yeah. You can claim the credit, mate. Um... Raphael, 1981. Kirshen, what was CBA-01, I presume? Uh, that was the Royal Navy aircraft carrier design in the 1960s. Um, basically, the Royal Navy were designing their next generation of Catabar carriers. CBA-01 uh, was going to be the first. And then it was all going through and approved between 1960 and 1963. Casper John steps down. Lucre steps up. And 1996, there is a defence white paper and carriers are cut. Oh, and again, the F-111 is cut as well eventually. So the Air Force don't even get their heavy, their bombers they were looking for. They get the they get um, things instead. Be simply because Luca couldn't. The RAF were a stronger politically at the time because of the way the Cold War was, and Luca couldn't persuade the RAF that they needed to support the carriers. And that the carriers could work together. 
Um, Casper John had managed to persuade the RAF and keep them on side, but it was basically the next two who took over. Luca couldn't really persuade the politicians, persuade the RAF, persuade anyone to listen to him, and ends up getting <coughs> the atrocity played the two against each other and they get to destroy them. Thank you. Daniel Freeman, I thought a clean tweet was firing all your torpedoes or in more modern developments. Tom Hawk missiles. Yeah. Jolly Roger was flown to celebrate kills or a successful mission. You can fly a Jolly Roger if you're coming home after having done a successful intelligence mission as well, because this is the Royal Navy and we sometimes use our submarines for intelligence gathering as well. Um, Steve White. Did the RN ever see most... Yes, Steam White, RN did have an H1. They did have submarines. The Royal Navy were quite pushy when it came to submarines and were quite involved in them from almost pretty much the get go. I know they don't like, they like to pretend, people like to pretend they weren't, but they really were quite heavily into it. Um. This is Who do you argue was the most influential single engineer in all of the Royal Navy? Also, hello. Well, hello, Francis. Uh, I'd have to say Stanley Goodall, honestly, the, some of the design practices he set out are still in place today, and his statements and formulas for how to design hulls for anti-submarine warfare are still the basis of the formulas used to this day, which is quite scary when you think about it, but uh, they are, so I'm going to go Stanley Goodall. Um, Stuart Cloak, one of the old class flew a junior rate after, yeah, yeah, a Jolly Roger after Gulf War, or Gulf War One. Yes, Stuart wrote, yes, it did. It did a very special operation, but that's really not as famous as what Conqueror got up to in 1982, but it did fly one. Um, Jeff Beeler, how many RN animals were World War One destroyer commanders compared to other navies? Effectively, this comes by Toby Cunningham, uh, Tovey, Cunningham, Vian. If anyone heard a hello come out, that was my mum. Um, just in case any of the friends who I who also know her are watching, she said hello. Um, I'd say, ooh. About 60% almost, I'm thinking, going from ahead, have been destroyer commanders. I'm going by either World War I or in the interwar years have been destroyer officers. And you lit, you have about 60%, I'd swear. Yeah. The destroyers were the, an elite part of the Royal Navy. Um, often destroyer officers, then they would go, after they'd had the destroyer would go car would go cruisers. Gunnery officers would go cruisers, battleships, more often than not. And then it would be from the cruisers, the, the destroyer captains would go up to uh, being admirals. And then it was from there they sort of worked their way up into the high command. But you have destroyers are a lot, a big part of the Royal Navy when it comes to producing officers. But also they're a good way for getting a relatively junior officer to have command experience early on. So that might explain why quite so many were involved in them. And it gets even more once you start including sloop commanders as well as destroyer commanders. Um, in car, a view on Admiral Tom Phillips would be an interesting topic. Seems well thought of, but unrealistic regarding aviation. Tom Phillips isn't as bad over aviation as people like to portray him. He isn't an idiot. He has been actually involved in quite a lot of processes going on. He wasn't always... Henderson's biggest fan, but he also wasn't always Henderson's biggest problem. Sometimes they were quite like allies in the Admiralty. Um, Phillips was conservative when it came to aviation, but he understood the threats. He would have dearly loved an aircraft carrier for Force V, but honestly, Force V shouldn't have been where it was, and he was given an impossible task. He should have had cruisers for economic warfare, and I'll, I'll get into this when I do the whole Malaya um, instance, uh, but and he should have forced the should have been where the eastern fleet was they should have been sitting back in salon ready to respond 
because if you can't deploy a big fleet, then don't deploy anything. You've got it's in gunboat diplomacy. Which, speaking of which, gunboat diplomacy. I hope you're all looking up your copies of that because that is a very useful book to read and a critical one for understanding modern naval modern naval operations. Where have I put my? Oh, it's sitting behind me. See, I put some books out to one side so I'd have them ready and then I forget them. Going back to diplomacy. Um, I always like this book because, as I said, it has some very, very interesting comments in it and stuff in it. But, whereas other books I recommend because they are wordy, uh, because they have pictures in and they're sort of quite nice. Really. This one is wordy but still is uh, worthwhile reading. And as I said, it doesn't have it doesn't have um, sort of the buzzwords in, but what it does have is this brilliant index in the back of incidents. And that's why I like to recommend it, because it gives you a whole lot of materials to go and look up. If you want to study more about naval diplomacy, so many of them will give you one or two case studies or even three or four case studies, but I want to go... This book has three or four case studies in, but it also has a list of about another hundred or so. You can go and look up and look at what happened. So that's really something useful. Mum, they're all saying hello to you. Right. Um... What do you think of the Osprey Light books on British cruisers? I have them all. Um, I have tons of the Osprey little books. Little Osprey books. Uh, I think I usually use them as my sometimes my initial sourcing. They're all actually underneath the camera. I've just noticed them. They're in the box. Are uh, literally looking at me from underneath the camera there, with the Japanese aces and, and the British Navy aces, aces etc. From that discussion on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, Kalata, if the RN practiced extensive night fighting, how did the Australian warships perform just as badly as the US warships in the night engagement off Guadalcanal? Because there is a big difference between night fighting as part of a group who have practiced night fighting together and night fighting as part of a group when you're working with people you're not used to. A classic example of this is, why didn't Ark Royal launch another strike at night against the Bismarck? They knew where she was. But they also knew that there were ships nearby which were British cruisers, which could be mistaken for Bismarck in the dark, and they frankly decided it was too much, It was more of a risk to do it than not. Uh, you know, it was more risk to do it than not do it. You know, she wasn't going to get away. She had four tribal class destroyers sitting around her. She wasn't getting anywhere. So, you know... It's a, it's a fun time. But, yeah, so Guadalcanal is interesting on that one. There's also some other issues, but, you know, it basically Guadalcanal is one of those scenarios where you have night fighting going on, yay. But, you know. So. Tonight, today is about admirals. Engineers and historians. And really, it's going to be about two historians in particular who I'm going to have to engage with because I've been talking about them and mentioning them the whole time. And at a certain point, I do have to get into it, even if I want to try and avoid them. Because it becomes a big, big thing. Very quickly. Alfred Taya Mahan, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660-1783. By the way, a guy called B.J. Armstrong, who did his PhD alongside me at King's College London under Andrew, has written a great book called What Would Alfred Taya Mahan Do? All about how Mahan would run the war in the Pacific. And it is really worth a read. And this is Some Principles of Maritime Strategy by Julian Corbett. Now, I'd have to say I find Julian cool because Julian has all sorts of books 
And I would say my sp the favourite one, the one I would tell you all to go get. Well, I should always tell people to go get this one. But actually, if you want a good historical read, a good one to read, it's England in the Mediterranean, a study of the rise and influence of British power within the Straits. Um, published in 1904, it's a, it's a good book. Now, why have I got Corbett, Mahan, Cable, Gorshkov, And I have no idea, but the Richmond book seems to have disappeared. Yeah, we have the other cable book, the cables books. Hmm. I had the Richmond book, I swear, there. <sighs> so, what do all these different people have in common? What are they? Well, they're all using history to try to justify a theory of war. They're all using history, in some respects, to justify their position and their naval uh, perspective and naval oper operations. Uh, Tis Francis Paul. It's funny. Gunboat diplomacy was first used to great effect by Cromwell all those years against, against, I believe, it was Genoa. I wish that was the first example of gunboat diplomacy. Um, it would certainly be quite poetic if it was, but no, other than the, uh, the Romans and the Chinese have been doing it. The voyages of Zheng He were pretty much gunboat diplomacy. Um, gunboat diplomacy on a massive, massive scale. Where's the Richmond book gone? That's annoying. Anyway. Throne Not and Castle of Steel by Robert Massey is a good book um, to start off with. It's, I wouldn't, how to put it, uh, it, it's not something I would stake my life on, but it is something which is a pleasurable read and it's a good entry point into the subject. So, Gorshkov. Hello, I am Gorshkov. Admiral of the Fleet of the Soviet Union, Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Navy. Um, the guy in the back of his own book. If you want to understand how Russia and China and India approach the world as naval powers, then you should realise one thing. The books taught in those, in those naval academies, they do teach these on the hand, they do teach Corbett, they do teach Cable, but they teach Gorshkov first. So they view all these, all these books, through the prism of this one. And Gorshkov is about taking, in many ways, the risk fleet strategy to its ultimate end. It's about how do you structure a navy, how do you build a navy that can deter conflict with a more far more powerful navy and stop them getting involved in war with them. And if they do get involved in a war with you, what they can do, or what you can do to them. And it all filters down into this. Soviet naval diplomacy. Written but edited by Bradford Dismukes and James McConnell. Um, it has chapters in it by... Oh, so, so many, so many different people. Um, and were people worth reading. It's the superpower confrontations. It's all sorts of things in here. This is a worth reading if you've already read this. Because you can pretty much predict what they're going to say and how the Soviets acted, how they th were thinking, what their plan of action was, if you've read this. And you can see the times when they go completely run rings around everyone and you can tell because it depends who's responding Gorshkov 
arguably, takes Corbett and adjusts it for the risk fleet strategy from a minor power versus a major power. It's about ends, not means. It ignores whether or not you have control of the sea. Because you might you might never get control of the sea if you're the smaller power. So it's got to. So it's a different perspective. And when we're talking about how admirals think, when we're talking about how engineers think, when your engineer is designing a ship, okay, as I explained, the third sea lord comes up with a concept. And this in the 1920s and 1930s, they come with they describe what they want. And then the naval architect, the director of naval construction, has to turn that from that mental image into something on paper. Well, to understand that, you have to understand what's the language that they're going to be communicating. What's the language the Admiral is going to be thinking in, in terms of what they want? Post Second World War, Soviet Navy and the modern Chinese Russian and Indian navies arguably are going to be thinking in the language of Gorshkov first. Arguably. So this is why it's useful to study Gorshkov. If you're an American navy, Mahan is probably going to come in first. And Mahan is all about gaining control of the sea. In fact, reading Mahan is arguably why the Japanese and the Americans were so similar in their doctrine of preparation for the Pacific War. Why they were all they were both focused on such a single side, we're going to bash each other to pieces approach. But it is complicated. I'm hoping the thing hasn't shut down and you're all still able to hear, because otherwise I'm talking to myself about the stuff, and that's just embarrassing. But leaving that to one side, no questions have popped through. Mahan is a powerful and persuasive thinker. But you always have to remember, what is Mahan arguing for? What is Gorshkov arguing for? Gorshkov is arguing for a navy against... Well, basically, the background of the Soviet Union's army. He's arguing for the role of a navy in the Soviet Union. Mahan is arguing for funding for a navy. He's arguing to build a navy. And this is structures why he's keeping it quite simplistic. Because the American society which Mahan is writing for are not really prepared are not really prepared for the nuance of naval warfare they are going they are been going through experiences like the civil war they have been going through big battles they are, understand the doctrine of battles they understand the need for control of a space whether it's land or sea so this is why his writing structures the way he does I don't think necessarily that Mahan is entirely focused on fighting battles and not thinking about how to use them. But I do think the trouble is his work has to do because he's making the case for the United States Navy. And in the nicest way, the modern United States Navy as we have today, as we see in the world, owes its very existence to this man, to Alfred Ter Mahan and this book. Okay? This is the foundation stone of the modern United States Navy. Without it, they wouldn't have been able to ask for funding. Without it, Roosevelt wouldn't have been able to make the cases he did for funding and other people did for funding. So you need Mahan. And as Stephen White has quite correctly pointed out, Mahan's father was a professor at West Point. Wonder why the twist into the Navy. It wasn't actually rebellious youth, though, as you think it might have been. It was a son thinking that his father cast a very big shadow. And he wanted to go off. He wanted to travel the world. And he wanted to be his own man. So he joined the Navy. Brock Payne. It seems to me that Theodore Roosevelt, having read Mahan, was the politician that pushed Mahan's ideas into fruition. 
About correct? Pretty much. Sometimes that's all you need to do if you're a historian and you want to change the world, or you're someone who wants to change the world. You need to write an argument which can persuasively arm someone who can communicate it with the wider world. You think about the modern societies we've had today. You think about how many politicians have critical aids. See, I'm making this topical. Who provide the information to them, provide them with arguments and these things, and then they turn it into the reality. And it's an old system. And in this case, it's Mahan's idea goes into it. Now, Jeff Beeler, how does the US strategies change since World War II? Um, well, they come in contact with another Navy. Because, you see, the Royal Navy gets them a hand. They go, well, hey, that's great. And they take it back to the Treasury and go, yeah, this is brilliant. Uh, yeah, this is why we need a Navy. The Royal Navy's going, we need a Navy because of this. We need a Navy because of this. Um, uh, oh. You know, it, it, it sort of works for a bit. It sort of works for a bit. But the trouble is, the Royal Navy and British are used to a far more nuanced conversation about naval power. They're not just caring about having big battleships. They want to know what you need to use those battleships for. They're also not care just caring about having aircraft, uh, about having cruisers. They want to know what you're having those cruisers for. And, well, thank God for Julian Stafford Corbett. Because he's the guy who answers those questions. Julian Corbett's book is pretty much... It is... Well, if I give you the titles, this is the, the, you know, the quick edition. Theory of War. The Natures of War, Offensive and Defense. The Natures of War, Limited and Unlimited. Limited War and Maritime Empires. Wars of Intervention, Limited Inference in e Unlimited War. Conditions of Strength in Limited War. Part 2. Theory of Naval War. Theory of the Object, Command of the Sea. And to, uh, theory of the Means. The uh, Constitution of Fleets. Thank you, Will Iridale. Thank you. Thank you for Super Chats. Oh, and again, as always, thank you to everyone who's a subscriber. Thank you to everyone who's a Patreon. Thank you to everyone who does all that stuff. That's really, really helpful because that's basically going to be paying my book bill for the summer. <laughs> that's where it's going for. I don't think I'll be able to get travel around for research much, so it will be book bill, which will be a lot of books. Um... And part three, theory of the method, concentration and dispersal of force. Then part three, conduct of naval war. So inherent differences in the condition of war on land, on sea, typical naval culture. And it carries on. Defensive fleet operations, a fleet in being. Yes. Um, all those who think Tirpitz is the guy who comes up with the risk fleet and is all this sort of is amazing. He does actually come as uh, sort of he starts saying it, but. Julian Corbett has said it earlier, and I always think actually Julian Corbett's later, because this is produced in 1911, book actually enunciates the risk fleet idea better. And in the nicest way, it ends with methods of exercising command, defense against invasion, attack and defense of trade, attack, defense, and support of military expeditions. This is a good book. If you haven't read Some Principles of Maritime Strategy by Julian Corbett, I should tell you that I think at the usually price, I've, I've picked this one up for about £5 in places because I tend to buy quite a few copies because I just give them to students. Um, I'm naughty like that. You know, the amount of students you have in your class. And I know as an early career researcher, and I'm hoping my family aren't watching this because they'll tell me off because I don't earn a million, a lot of money at all as an early career researcher. Um, but I have students who are poorer than me by a long, long way. And books like this can be really, really helpful, especially if I can pick them up for five quid. So. And those who brought my book. Oh, yes, of course, Dutchman. Thank you to the people who buy my book. 
I, I'm trying to sort of forget about that at the moment. I'm in the point, point stage of editing where in the nicest way I'd, I'd like to forget about it if I'm not doing it. But it, thank you to everyone who is by my book. That is really going to be helpful because, well, I want that book to be read. That's why I'm writing it. I, I, I can never understand people who write books and then go, oh, yes, and I, I, I've written a book and I, I just, it's going to be priced at, you know, this extraordinary is going to be about 20 copies sold. It's just not me. I, I I can understand it as a sort of exercise, but it's just not me. Me, I want hundreds. I want ton, uh, thousands of people to read the book and see what the tribal class, battle class, and daring class got up to. Um, Jay Ellingworth. In some ways, Mahan was very much an anti-the isolationist attitude of the US around the, across about the 100 years up to including the 1930s. Yes, he was. Nick, Nicasia, Dr. Clark, what about From the Dreadnought to Star Scuffer Flow, Volumes 1 to 5? Do they still hold up to scrutiny? Yeah, they're, that's what's right. they're a good starting point. Most of the older books are a good starting point. Off license, Alexander. What is your assessment on naval education of all the leading staff naval colleges? Do they really get Corbett and Mahan? Can they think big? They do. They do. Um, B. J. Armstrong, the guy who write, uh, wrote the excellent book, "What Would Alfred Fair Mahan Do," is a lecturer at Annapolis. So that's the kind of ca person you have there. He is frankly amazing, and I am very jealous that those midshipmen get such a fine education from him. And get paid from it, uh, pay, paid to have it. Just terrible. Michael Rose got Corbett's book for under ten pound on Amazon last week. Fantastic read, and already quoting it in the interstation. You will be. It is an excellent book. I also have his. Um, well, I have England in Seven Years War, both editions. But as I said, the the campaign of Trafalgar. Uh, Longman, London, produced by Long, Longman's Green Company in 1910, is also really worth a read. Uh, Dutchman, how a future historian described his your book? I will leave that to the future historians. I hope they treat it kindly. I hope they say it was a good start. I'm sure it won't be the end. Uh, Jeff Beeler, how do staff colleges affect navies over time? They affect, have a big impact because... It's as Navy start to professionalise, and one of the big problems the Royal Navy has in the mid... Well, definitely towards the end of the Cold War, is because of the variations of the Staff College and eventually the loss of Greenwich, and the combined Staff Academy and how they spin round to it and how they deal with it, and the way the Royal Navy runs Manning, makes the Royal Navy very weak when it comes to staff work versus the other services, which puts them at disadvantages in certain scenarios. They are trying to work on that. Um, Sam Urgia, concur on BJ Armstrong. Yep. Uh, Emman, what's your number one book about the interwar Royal Navy? Ooh, interwar Royal Navy. There isn't really that does anything that does the interwar Royal Navy. Um, Andrew Field is pretty good. Andrew Field I like. But really there's no real book about the interwar Royal Navy. Pretty much every book will tell you about the interwar Royal Navy as part of World War II. Or the interwar Royal Navy as part of World War One, Or that. They don't, they don't consider the 20 years in between the wars as worthy of a book themselves. Um... Banham, I got the first read of Corbett through Land Lambert's collection of essays on him and then got the book because I write articles about naval matters in Denmark and it is useful to have. It is. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, my first read on Metal Battleships was a library copy of Dreadnought by Richard Hoff back when I was about 10 long, long ago. Yeah, we've all done that one. But I have someone else here I keep talking about. Where does he come? So, Corbett is about how you use the command of the sea, getting it and how you use it. 
But Corbett is still talking about war more often than not. He does a bit about peace, but he's talking more about war. And Mahan is talking about war. But navies spend a lot of time in peace. And they have to fight peace just as hard as they have to fight war. Because peace can be an uncertain time. Technically, the South China Sea is at peace. But let's be honest, the way the Chinese are acting at the moment, it's very, very, it's very, very choppy. Technically, we're at peace in the Straits of Hormuz. But Iran has been getting up to all sorts of things there. This is Julian Corbett. This is the not where Julian Corbett sort of leads into James Cable. And James Cable is an army officer who becomes a diplomat and then publishes some books under a pseudonym before becoming a naval theorist who's writing books. And some of the books I've listed up there. You know, um, some of his books. Diplomacy at Sea, 1985. Gunboat Diplomacy, of course, in 1971. And the Political Influence of Naval Force in History. Navies in a Violent Peace. These are critical. Okay. Show before to two. Is it just me or is it out of sync? I hope it's not out of sync. Anyway, so while you can have a look at this, I will answer some of the questions. Um, but Corbett, uh, Corbett, Mahan, Cable, Richmond, if I can find his book, are all worth a read. Richmond is the guy who comes after Corbett, but before Mahan and really isn't that great. He tries, but he gets obsessed with Sir Walter Raleigh. Massively obsessed with Sir Walter Raleigh. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'd be surprised if I wouldn't be surprised if I found out he dressed up like him. Um, okay. Any cop? Any suggestion on a book about German battlecruiser fleet, First World War? Oh. There was one I think called the Kaiser's Cruisers. I think the title translated as, but it was a translated book. Uh, from a German author, so I'm not sure. Um, really, the person I'd have to ask is Marcus Faulkner, because he is the, by far and away the best person I know on the German Navy. Dr. Marcus Faulkner, Naval History War on Twitter, is absolutely amazing. If you don't follow him, please do go and follow him. He is very, very good. I also have a World War One James fighting ship somewhere around here, which is also fairly good on their their fleet. But no, I'd say if anyone knows in what that book is actually called, it's him. Um, off license, Alexander. I was watching your video with Jamie regarding cruisers, uh, carriers. What's a cruiser carrier? Please describe what carriers a carrier cruiser would have. Okay, right. So. A cruiser carrier versus a strike or armoured carrier is a smaller carrier. Their role is to keep up with the cruisers and operate forward. So HMS Unicorn would have been the template for a cruiser carrier. The light fleet carriers, as originally built from Unicorn, rather than sort of when they're not, when the Royal Navy was more limited by treaty, rather than having the freedom of war, would have probably been cruiser carriers. And you get a sort of divergence of the cruiser carrier role in that those grow up and escort carriers are the ones that come in and fill it up. So you have sort of Argus and Eagle and you have sort of two strands of cruiser carrier sort of get developed. where you have got a bigger one, which is basically your forward deployed supporting carrier for your fleet operations, but also going to do the cruiser carrier role and your escort carriers, which come in to replace Argus. These are the sort of things that are they are cheap cheerful to operate and they'll provide necessary aviation for convoy trade protection duties and those sort of things uh, 
In car, useless Deanicot and his relationship with Watts, including a tank. Uh, okay, so they found each other a bit annoying, but... Watts had you appointed Eustace, and Eustace to take his place, and Eustace was... They were both very sure they were the best in the world at what they did, okay? And that's the reason you have the issues you do. But they are both very, very good. But it is a bit fractious. And I'm going to do something more about Eustace at another point, I think. I, I haven't included him in the third one, in the third movie, to, uh, third video to discuss. Jalingworth, what is peace? Surely that is why they write about war. Well, that is a good, I, a good point. But peace is any period when you're not in a declared war. And for navies, the difference between a war and a peace can be a war is a lot easier. Because you can finally shoot your own enemies and you know exactly who you're fighting. In peacetime, you don't know who's your friend or who's your foe because you don't know what you're dealing with. But it is still there. I, I'm noticing some problems with the Wi-Fi, so I'm just going to move you in a bit closer. And hopefully that's going to work properly. Okay. And hopefully there won't be any issues. Right then. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, my first naval history book was a little grey one called Battleships, a library book me and my friends took turns reading. Sounds cool. Primate uh, 359, not Subic Bay. Uh, Subic Bay will not be leased back as long as the current Philippine government still is in office. Yeah, probably not, no, but it depends on life. Uh, Jeff Beeler, Hermes is the classic cruiser character. Pretty much Hermes, Eagle. These were sort of cruiser, cruiser carriers. They were going to build something slightly bigger. They're sort of the bigger end of the spectrum of the cruiser carrier. But they're deployed for that. Kopf Arshich. Kopf. Orfitschau? Kopf Orfitschau? Sometimes I think people are just trying to cruel to me now but no no uh yeah um you all know how bad i am pronunciation so i do apologize if i mangle your names completely uh perhaps i even go with a german book well that would be sensible because it's probably better in the original language you lose something in translation you definitely do lose something in translation um primark three five nine this francis fault what's the best book for 17th century ships and doctrine following the early land battles of sea being superseded by generals at sea to fully realised admirals and more realised naval doctrine. Uh, oh, this is going to pay me to say it. Oh. Look. Come on, uh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Rogers, N.A.M. Rogers, Command of the Ocean. It is mahusiv. It is the best starting point for anything you're going to do on the 17th and 18th centuries. And even a little bit into the 19th. I have issues with Nicholas because of the way sometimes he seems to react to young historians getting involved in history and new voices coming through in history but he is a very very good historian okay so i highly recommend his book mm -hmm. right uh strub is the cv a type of cruiser car <laughs> uh the queen elizabeth class are and cvs these days are strike carriers they are strike carriers um, I would suggest the Invincible class, uh, they were probably a type of cruiser carrier, but very, very much on the trade protection end of it. Um, but CV is a designation, doesn't mean cruiser carrier. It can mean all sorts of things. So you have to be careful, it depends on the class. Alexander, off license, Alexander, have you ever done any work videos on the seaward defence books, boats, like uh, the f Fords? Very little on them. Uh, I haven't done yet, but I, can I haven't done any videos yet, but I have done some work. 
Straub, though, yeah. Uh, Cop fashion. Yeah, Daniel Freeman. <laughs> uh, Grace Starsky, and Dr. Clark. Also, of the previous volume, Safeguard of the Seas. Yes, pretty much. It's the series that Nicholas Rogers done. Um, Primark, what about the flat bomb destroyers? Repa they are so cruiser carriers. When they have the ski ramp for today, they're going to be cruiser carriers. Um, Wasp class will be a modern version, Lionheart X-ray. Probably, yeah. Uh, off license, I loved your description of sloop cruiser diplomacy. Ah, we're we talking about Singtel. Actually, give me a second. I'm going to grab something from over there. But I'm going to have to do some work to do it. Be there in a second. Where is it? Oh, there it is. There it is. Sorry. Hunting book. Hunting book. Hunting book. Apologies for that. Um, by the way, um, Leonard C. Reynolds, Dog Boats at War. It's not what particularly today's topic is about. But I got a flash up on Facebook reminding me of a book review I once did on this book. And it is amazing if you're interested in little boats. And it's where a lot of the little ship stuff I'm talking about is going to be coming from. Also, the modern one, Lawrence Freeman, Future of War. It's a good one. I actually used it as a teaching text when I was teaching the Future of War at Cambridge. Yes, I taught a summer course at Cambridge on the Future of War for teenagers. And um, they had a fun time. Anyway, the, if you're going to be doing diplomacy at sea and you want to do things, you either have to turn up, if you're the bit a major power, and Drac puts this brilliantly in this week's episode of Village Punts, what comes out this week, um, you either turn up with everything, overwhelmingly, or you turn up with the minimum. And that's something which this really does teach. And the thing is, you learn admirals have had a lot of time getting to know this knowledge through many years. But the trouble is, there's an admiral, when you've got these historians start coming in and these sort of engineers really pushing forward the ships, that's also the time when you've got technology changing and politicians getting more involved. So what the admirals used to be able to do, Collingwood, for example, would have handled it completely as Corbett and as Cable said. But he wouldn't have had to explain what he was doing to the politicians. He wouldn't have explained, explained what he was doing to the government. So what these books do in many ways, they provide a framework of language for explaining themselves and their actions to their governments. Right. Uh, Primark uh, 359. I'm not sure anything with a well deck would be a cruiser carrier. Um, honestly, considering the amount of times cruisers were involved in amphibious operations in the interwar years, I'd say actually if they're not carrying a well deck, it isn't part of the, it isn't proper cruiser carrier in some respects. Um, definitely doesn't live up to the cruiser part, but yeah, it's, you know, it's a case of it's how you're using it. And in uh, modern aircraft carrier, and modern ships especially, it's going to depend on the air that you're putting on it. Are you putting on a trade protection or scouting effort 
what are you doing with it? You know, that's what a cruiser carrier force was for, is for scouting and for trade protection. Off license, we need a handful of batch two rivers and type 31 groups for a modern sloop cruiser off the iron. Probably. As I've said, I've put it, my rough figure is about 12 type 31s and 12, 10 to 12 type 31s and 10 to 12 type uh, batch two rivers. And you would have five or so deploy, uh, five pairs of a type 31 and a batch two deployed forward in five different places and you have the rest operating out of the UK. And that would sort of provide UK with the fishery protection squadron needed, the deployable frigates it needed, and then you'd have the battle groups of the Type 26s and Type 45s on top. Ah, uh, Rob Marsh, how do you think the RN needs to change post Brexit? Does this mean a modern, more focus on being able to protect trade on a global basis? We needed that anyway, you know. Let's put it this way. There is a reason I am going through these and I want more people to read. People like James Cable, Julian Corbett, Mahan, Gorshkov. I, you, one of the problems that's happened in the world, and I sit this and I see this quite often, and I'm sort of preaching to the converted, I realise here, but you know, so I have to be careful with my tones. You need at the everything's got so fast that people don't often get the time to sit and take a long form time to think about things, and these are not quick digest books, these are long reads that are useful and allow you to think about what you're doing in the world. And it's like with the admirals we're talking about, so you know, if I'm going to talk about Admiral Henderson. Uh -huh. And I'm going to mention again the great Wikipedia page that has about him. And I'm hearing things that I think maybe there might be a Wikipedia page coming about Michael Clapp as well. It's good things that this has done because these are officers who took time to think about things. To think about how they were going to do it and how they were going to do the stuff and how things were going to be done. But they were taking time to think about it in peacetime. And they had the time in those times to think about peacetime. And you need to. Um, off license. Well, we don't need to protect an empire, only trade and a handful of possessions and interests. Um, money always is going to play a big role, yes. But. <sighs> Dangeld only works when you can turn up with something yourself. Okay? Dane Geld only works when you can turn up with something yourself. You can use money to support and, and local nations and local powers, but as NGOs which do wildlife preservation in Africa would tell you, they hire the locals and they keep give them going. But if they don't turn up to provide those locals with regular training, regular contact, then they lose control of what they're paying for. They don't have influence. And then things can go wrong. All sorts of issues can happen. They can lose complete idea of what's going on. It's not so much control, they can lose influence over what's happening. And that's what they're doing, and they need to, for their operations to work successfully. If you want influence and have a stable maritime sphere to support global trade, you can't rely on everyone else doing it for you. You have to be able to show up, especially at the pinch points, so that you can say, well, we show up. We might not be able to show up in much for, uh, as much force as the others, but we show up in enough with enough. And it's not just showing up on occasion. It's having to have an ongoing presence. And that's why you sort of had the Type 31s and the Rivers forward. Right. Greg Shashi, is Aiden Dodson any good? I see he's he has the Kaiser's Battle Fleet out and the Kaiser's Cruisers for 2021. He's fairly good, yeah. You know, I've enjoyed his... I've enjoyed the books he's... I've already read of his, so I presume the other ones are good. Be good. 
Um, off license. Yeah, we don't need massive numbers. No, I never talk about massive numbers. As I said, it, the sort of 10 to 12, uh, it's 25 to 27 escorts is what Britain needs to be about. And if you think about it, you then go through and go, well, why are we generating that one? Well, when you've got the forward base of 12, you need six back to, you need about seven back in the UK to forward base five. And if you've got nine type 26s and six type 45s, that means you'll always have one task group of two type 45s and three type 26s ready to operate and one pretty much ready to go as well. So you usually be able to, you know, mount a carrier battle group and an amphibious task group with some decent escorts. It's not about having huge numbers. It's about having rel available capability. Derishan, Axel Clark, do you think the river should have more armament? Single 30 millimeters isn't great. Um, look, if I was going to up arm the rivers i'd probably put a 40 millimeter on the front two 30 millimeters with the new um, missile system on the side and a close in weapon system of phalanx on the back literally it would be guns and it would literally be simple just enough to raise the level at which if you're going to take the ship you're going to have to do something bring something heavy so you're going to have to go out to full own war but not massively and probably some UAVs as well. But that's me being, you know, very fantasy. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. <coughs> Daniel Freeman, Jamie, uh, being annoying or escort carrier? A period, I think American source of terms like you see have a weird origin for the V uh, to do with flying and basing on cruisers, hence C. Yeah, there is all sorts of things in NATO acronyms. Tony Penfield, how would you rebuild the Type 23 rather than retire them? I wouldn't. I'd retire them. They have had nearly 30 years, some of them more of hard, hard use. My dad built them. I am as attached to them as anyone can be. And honestly, we need a couple to be kept as museum ships, or at least one to be kept as a museum ship, really. But the others have had their hulls caved in. They have been used in the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, for the last 20 to 30 years. Those hulls are falling, are going to start falling to par, apart not very long soon. We've done as much as we can to keep them going. But we have got about 10 or so more years out of those hulls before they go wrong, which is why the Type 26 and Type 31 programs are so urgent. Okay. Jeff Beeler, information naval constructors other than Watts and Google's opinion of the knuckle? Look, if you want naval good naval constructors, you're. Well, my fa one of my favourites is um, Nathaniel Barnaby, who I'm going to be mentioning in the third movie, uh, third video. Um, he's a very, very cool character. But then you've got, well, frankly, Arthur Johns and Victor Shepherd. Both don't get the credit they deserve. Um, I'm never quite sure about... Goodall, Goodall's write-up, because, you know, I know how long Google, Goodall was in post, and Wikipedia somehow produces this guy and puts Lily Crap in there and i'm sort of going no that wasn't when he was there but you know there's all sorts of people in different places mm -hmm. right
off license. Alexander, has China been successful in takeover of South China Sea? No. Uh, the Freedom of Navigation Patrols, let's put it this way. For China, as long as it's had to the islands, that's their measure of success. You can do your Freedom of Navigation and say you shouldn't be here. But if you don't do anything about those islands, they don't consider it a failure. And we look like idiots. But we still have to do those patrols because those patrols aren't about kicking the Chinese out of the islands. They're about reassuring allies. So that's why you do them. It's naval diplomacy. And it's, it's, it's the risk strategy because the Chinese are going to keep pushing the envelope until someone bites back hard enough that they think, oh, hang on, we can't do that. So that's what they've been doing with India. And it's slowly built up. That's what they're doing in the South China Sea. That's what they're doing in the East China Sea. That's what they're doing with Taiwan. That's what they've done with Hong Kong. That's the way these kind of nations work. They push and they push and they probe and they probe. And when they have the chance, they go for it. Um, but I do agree with Primark, uh, Primark that if you want me to cover it properly, that is like an eight-hour lot of uh, eight-hour conference. And honestly, that was probably me, um, Jamie from Armored Carriers, and Drac having a nice long conversation. Oh yeah, that was actually that's been the last three recordings of the podcast bilge pumps because China every week do so many new stuff that uh, we as doing a topical thing cannot ignore them which must be fun for the admirals at the moment because that means they can't ignore them either um okay tis transform you need enough ships to keep your bases covered whilst others are out in the field if you only have enough in play to cover the bases don't go expecting to do adventures yeah which is why you have the Type 31s and Rivers to do cover the bases. And you have the Type 26s and 45s to go doing the adventures if they need to. Um, Strub, with modern communication fleets mostly going under flags of convenience, how does that affect protecting them? It makes issues because Panama is technically is protected by the US Navy. Technically, they are protected by the US Navy. Um, and all sorts of things. And all these flags of convenience, usually they have bigger navies which are responsible for protecting them. I.e. any Commonwealth flagged navy can request help from any other Commonwealth nation's navy. Lovely little point in the Commonwealth. Um, Cali uh, Harley. The Falklands showed that the Western power was prepared to fight on its own for something it believed in. Before that, the Russians generally had doubts this would happen. Yes, they did. Which is why they watched the Falklands War so, uh, so uh, heavily. Garlington, how many main gun rounds did the Bismarck carry? Sorry about spelling. It's huh. an interesting question. I never really looked into the Bismarck because I always know that the Royal Navy ships carry around about 200 to 400 rounds depending on type per gun. So I always presumed that theirs was probably a roughly equivalent, but I'll have to look that up. I honestly do not know the answer. I will look it up. I will look it up. Kindson. Um, off lessons. Alexander, what's your view on the naval air, uh, naval ram and the torpedo ram? Well, see, here's the interesting thing. The rams come about in a period, really, when Clausewitz is, uh, Clausewitz is talking and all these sort of things are starting to affect the world and all sorts of military theorists are starting to talk about things. But the naval theorists really haven't got started. Not the ones we would talk about naval theorists today. Um, definitely not. It's even pre-Lawton's time. Rams are... Well, here's the thing. The interesting thing about a ram. HMS Dreadnought makes one kill in her entire life. And that is thanks to her ram. She splits a submarine in half. You would hope to never have to use a battleship to do that, but it worked. My theory is the specialist ram vessels were built for a unique period of time, but weren't really a viable option for a proper war. 
And when I say a proper war, I mean if they'd been against a pier which had equivalently ironclad vessels, they weren't really going to work. The whole idea was that your ironclad ram could smash through wooden ships. No. Um, Primark, 359. Uh, Dr. Clark, would the UK be better served by adopting a version of the FREM given the USN is even adopting some? No. Why do we need the FREM? We've got the Type 26, which we are selling elsewhere around the world, and we've got the Type 31, which is being very customised for our needs and is coming in on budget. So you, <clears throat> you sort of go, what does the FREM fill here? Does the FREM fill the Type 26 role? Well, we've got an indigenous design. So you want to cut an indigenous design, which we are selling and managing to sell around the world very successfully so that we can build a, a foreign design in the UK? Or, you know, and, and it's a very good design. Or are we cutting the Type 31, in which case we're going to replace what was basically a stripped down cheaps and chips version of a destroyer uh, with a frigate which has issues as far as we're concerned. Yeah, we'll keep with the we'll keep the options we have. They're quite good for us. Okay, I believe the UK needs to give us to defend itself and to back up what it believes in. That means ships, after all, we are an island nation. Yes, we are. So is Japan. Perry Ransom, a thousand four round, uh, rounds of ammunition for her main battery of thirty eight centimeter guns. So. You think how many guns that won't be per gun though? So the Royal Navy one, the figures I was giving was 200 to 400 per gun. Usually 200 the bigger guns you get closer to. So I, if I was talking about a county class cruiser, I would be talking about 1600 rounds of ammunition. So if she's got about a thousand and four rounds of ammunition for her batteries, then yeah. You know, that's what you're looking at. How many she got per gun? That's not that many if by my count. Um Jeff Biller, the rivers are present ships need sensors more than weapons. Helicopters useful. Yeah. Canadian will serve these. Yeah, you have helicopters or rotary UAVs. These are all useful things. Um, you need sensors. The presence is about sensors. As I said, the sloop and the cruiser, the sloop was basically the 1920s, 1930s equivalent of having a helicopter and Marines aboard. Hello, we're here. You see me? Yeah, you see me. I look good. Well, yes, you might be bigger than me, but I've got my bigger pal over there. And he's got even bigger, she's got even bigger pals sitting over the horizon. So, you know, you have to be nice to me. Because otherwise, I'll get my pals and all my sisters involved. Because every time you see a sloop, she is basically swagging up going, I got all my sisters with me. Yeah, you ain't gonna fight me. Because they may not be where you can see. But they'll take thee. That is how I torture my students. <laughs> uh, thank you. Come on, Ken. I, I... Inca, how much detailed design of the warship was undertaken in the RM design office and how much by the yards? Was this different with the HMU shipyards where constructors? Um... There was always a tremendous amount taken undertaken by the constructors. In fact, it was a massive... It still is. There is still the Department of Naval Constructors. They still do a lot of the design work for Navy ship designs. So still a lot goes through the Navy. They don't have as many as they used to be. They don't have the power they used to be. They don't have the presence they used to have. But in the 1920s and 30s, it was pretty much the director of Naval Construction's word was absolute when it came to a design, the only people who could cross-examine him were the third Sea Lord and the first Sea Lord, and they had better know what they were talking about first. Um, See, so my high schooler who went to high schooler skipped war, went college, and again studied civil war first semester and resumed the next semester. And yeah, war is history too. Concentrate history, in fact. Yes, it is, but. 
you need to study the peace and teach the peace as well as the war. You need to teach both. Um, Jeff Bill, is Nelson the Vanguard good for interwar history? It covers it occasionally. It, it it feels to me a little bit rushed, but it has World War One and it has World War Two to deal with. So you know, those are the focus points. Um, Ian Carr, following your 1929 War Games book review, I assume the published RN book was secret. If so, to what sort of uh, ranks were the results made available? It was secret, but pretty much everyone in the Navy could have read a copy of those uh, things. It's a case of it was very openly around the Navy to help them. It had to be. Uh, it's uh, Sigma, those times are very important. War is just a violent extension of politics. Human history isn't just battle. Yeah. No, it isn't. But it's, you know, the transition between two. Again, gunboat diplomacy. The reason the admirals matter and all these things matter is the choices that are made are going to have a big impact on what's going on. Um, Tony Penfold, which of the Type 31 options did you want? I won. That's where that tells you everything I want. I wanted the design which is the biggest and most easy to adapt and most easy to change to fit to whatever future needs we have. Arrowhead 140 worked perfectly for that. Uh, Kai Anderson, if we had an F4 with China, how long would our carriers last? Well, it depends how you're going to use them. If you charge in with the carriers right up to the enemy coast, and sit there and go, hello, we're here. They'll probably sink you quite quickly because you'll get deluged and stuff. But if you do suppression of enemy air defences and you take out their communications and their intelligence assets as you work your way in and slowly push back their defence perimeter, which will take longer but will work quite well, you will probably still have most of your carrier force left at the end of the war, whereas you will have probably pretty much airfield, every airfield within a missile range, or every airfield they can find on Google, will have been taken out at some point. The advantage of a carrier is it moves. It means you can start and work your way in. It isn't always a good option, but it's usually the better option. Uh, amen. During the Napoleonic Wars, the French Navy did poorly. Their usually explanation for is that many of its common officer men left or were killed. Is there anything more to why they did so poorly? You have to look at the characters of the people involved and the admirals and the things. In the nicest way, the French Navy still could do quite well when it had officers who were prepared to take risks. But the French Navy in the Napoleonic Wars suffered from the same issue the navies of the, Ger the Kriegsmarine and the Regia Marina suffer in World War II. You have a central government who doesn't like losing ships. They don't. That affects how you operate handle operations. After the license, are the royal courts and naval construction still in Bath? Yes. Have you ever met any of them, Alexander? Yeah, my dad was one. Um, for a while, a few years ago. My dad was a naval architect, and my dad did work with them at one point. I'm not sure if he was actually an official member or if he just worked with them, but I know he spent a lot of time there. He also spent, he did his, inter, he did his apprenticeship. He was a fully trained shipwright as well as a naval architect at Camel Laird's. And he worked for Lloyd's Register. He did all sorts of things. And yeah, he was a superstar. A superstar. Hence, he's in, uh, he's in episode one. I said, Ian, today. Um, Perry Roden. Turpets were supposed to carry twice the ammunition loadout of Bismarck around. But like her sisters, never got to load it to that level. Ah, uh, yeah. That would be quite... Un that wouldn't be unusual. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, Banhope, the dance and song routine is really good. I mean, really. The CIA engaging could have found it to, to terribly effective for interviews. It would work. But, you know, it's the point. And it sticks in students' minds, so that's why I use it occasionally. But it's to try and make the point is that, yes, you see in front of you a sloop. You see just one ship. One little ship. And you've got all your mighty ships around her. 
but you have to treat her very carefully because what she represents is not the next uh, the cruiser sitting behind her it's the fleet which will come in if anything happens to this little ship so that is the point of that song it sticks in the head and it's, it's the thing they have to do you have to stick in your head you have to think about it this is naval diplomacy so that's the trouble one of the interesting things i find um book i'm writing about the book is almost done churchill writes you know uh, are the daring class going to be as proficient as cruisers in looking good and in having impact when they sail into areas yes they will but the fact is honestly it doesn't matter if they do or don't what matters is that they are british ships and if you see a british warship you know there is the british fleet behind it it doesn't matter what size ship you're dealing with it doesn't matter if you're seeing an rfa you see that gray ship flying a white ensign you know, don't do it. Don't mess with it. <clears throat> Evan, can you also do a future video about Malta striking forces, especially since they conducted the economic warfare you talked about in previous videos? Yes, we'll do. Uh, see mine. Uh, Primark three five nine. Everyone or every officer. Uh, pretty much most officers, a vast majority of officers could have, well, any officer who wanted to could have read it, but also most senior NCOs. <laughs> Nastasia, uh, Nastasia, Dr. Clark, what about the British battleships of World War II by Anna Raven and John Roberts? I always liked it, having picked up a copy when it was released. It's good luck. Uh, off license, did your dad know DK Brown? I think so. I seem to remember him chatting about him. Night Heron Production, what were your what are your thoughts on a proposal existing? I don't know. Uh, I'd say this Iron Bess in either Brunei or Singapore is forward based the RN carrier group. There is an RN base in Singapore. It's been stood up for many, many years. And I wouldn't be surprised if it goes the same way as what's happened in the Gulf, in that you get a forward base type 31 and possibly a forward-based river class there, sitting there watching the straits and being part of Britain in South. Not quite sure of the correct date. I'd have to ask my mum. She would remember the dates perfectly. Um, he used to sometimes talk about the things, but I don't, I haven't really, it's going to sound strange. I remember the stories and not the dates for what the summer stuff he was talking about. And he did have a lot of fun at Camelot. He stayed at Camelot for a good few years. Uh, Jeff Beeler, Nelson Vanguard does mention Henderson and gives him a one-page entry. Goodall gets two pages, for example. It also mentions Forbes. Yeah, that's why I say it's it's good, but it, it's a, on the interwar itself, it's a bit skippy on some things. It misses some stuff. This first of all, do you think we lose out by having a concentration of naval production into a small number of companies? I think in the end, that's all you're going to have, because unless you're building a lot of ships, that's always going to be the case. Uh, off ice. Singapore is a bit tight. Brunei is a bit too close to the Chinese mainland. Yeah, that it's true, but you know, Brit Singapore is where would be. Uh, which unit, uh, Jeff Miller? Which unit built the airstrip at San Carlos? I think it was the Commando Engineers, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Could have been some other specialist engineers, but it was, I think it was Commando Engineers. Kim McGuire, as Madeleine Albright commented, she had no problem dealing with patriarchal cultures when she flew there in an official airplane. Bingo. Lawrence Cook at Kay Haley. One of my favourites, gotta love the French pre dreadnoughts We all do love the French pre dreadnoughts They are quite cute. Um, Jeff Beeler, in the Falklands, Conqueror was the threat. Conqueror was a massive threat. Um... Strub, is this why the USA, uh, USCG is doing freedom of navigation patrols of the US Navy? So it does not look like escalating, but everyone knows a fleet is over the horizon. Bingo. Because what does the US Navy currently lack? They have a whole of Arleigh Burks. Super powerful destroyers. Yeah. And LCS. Mm. 
Okay, now theoretically the LCS as conceived and as planned could have been excellent for this role. They could have been these great present ships, these four deployed ships. The trouble is something's gone wrong in the execution. So what the Americans have lost is they've lost the Oliver Hazard Perry role. The fact is the Oliver Hazard Perry was a great ship for these freedom navigation things. You know why? No one really considered them much of a threat. They're a bit and they're Danger if you were a submarine, but everyone else there was sort of going, eh, it's a great big box on a hull. We can ignore it. But it's March of Rare. If you react like you're at war with an Oliver Hazard Perry coming through, you look a bit like an idiot. The thing is, the Americans don't have that anymore. In a way, in a way, the LCS both look too deadly and are not deadly enough to actually do the job. It's just annoying. Strop. Private food. Doesn't Singapore being Singapore and have a different relationship with China kind of complicate any decision of China to strike that, uh, that base? It does complicate everything. Now, I have managed to get off topic by questions, and I do apologise to people who are watching this a bit later. I will get back into topic in a bit. But the trouble is some of the questions are very interesting. And really, I should probably be answering them on Santa going, save them for the Sunday brew ships. But, uh, you know, hey ho. So, today we're looking at admirals, engineers, and things. Now, the other engineer, who I haven't talked, I'm basically supposed to do the question and session to go with the videos, so that's why I'm not so worried about it. There are full videos which have all these things properly discussed. Um... But one of the engineers I do want to bring up and I do want to talk about is Nathan Barnaby. Um, he was chief constructor of the Royal Navy from 1872 to 1885. Now, he is... What's interesting about him is that he actually... He gets promoted because his boss, Sir Edward Reed, who he when he become when he becomes chief of naval construction, marry is married to Barnaby's sister, so Barnaby gets drawn in that way, and it turns into a real sort of family affair. But they do a really really good job of managing this navy in transition, and when he dies at eighty six. Just trying to get it to come up. There is a whole long article produced about him. And it lists all the ships he designed. And he does so, so many. I think it's between him, in my mind, and Stanley Goodall as to who's devised, uh, who's built and designed the most ships. Yep, he's White's predecessor. Ian Carr, the War Games book would seem to have been a really useful document for the Foreign Navy. True, yes, it would have been, but... And the big thing is, it doesn't actually include the real levels of what British ships are capable of doing in. It contains the War Games rules of what they're capable of doing in. Okay? There is a method to the madness. They do try and stop them getting hold if they can. They don't want them to get hold of it, but if they do, it might well throw their figures off just a tad. Just a tad. Uh... This transfer, what was the Argentine and his submarine force during the Falklands? Could they have realistically threatened and conqueror enough to protect Belgrano? During the Falklands War, the Argentine submarine force did, did manage to achieve many uh, mission delays and some mission scrubs for the Royal Navy submarine force. But often they didn't achieve much more than that. And they very rarely actually got anywhere close to a submarine. It's just they were 
using enough active raid, uh, active sonar and all sorts of things that the submarine, would, if it had actually pressed home the attack, would have got, got into a lot of trouble. And it was better not to lose a nuclear sub. Jeff Beeler. US Marine Corps shifting two more and more Royal Marine Commando strategy. I think they are. Uh, Again, McQuire, it is hard to procure a ship that is deliberately second rate. Don't think of it as second rate. Okay, well, but, you know, the next way, the Royal Navy did actually issue that they record, procured second class cruisers and these sort of things. But they're not thinking them as second rate, they're thinking them as roles for that mission. What are they? Jo their job? In wartime, they're part of the task group. In peacetime, they're the presence ships. They are the cheap. Ships, the night, the hull, extra hulls in the water that allow you to properly maintain and properly train your battle fleet. So don't think of them as second class. Think of them as part of the whole force structure you're building. <laughs> Off license. OHP frigates were fantastic for the US Navy. Isn't it strange that every time the US Navy wants a new frigate, they end up with a mini Burke? It's because every time they want a new frigate, they are looking to track, pack in the equivalent capabilities of what they've already got. And that's the problem. It's got to compete with a Burke for funding. And a Burke is a very, very fine tool and a very capable. Jane there is quite a bit about Barnaby in Norman Freeman's book on destroyers that I'm reading moment. I'm not surprised. Norman Freeman does do quite well talking about these people. He does. He is good on that one. Uh, Daniel Freeman, this transport. The Bergrunner had two somewhat LDX ex USNDDs with her, but Argentina did have some more cable assets, e.g. aboard the carrier. They did have some stuff, things around. Um... Jeff Beeler, who are the good Victorian era admirals in any navy? Um, Hornby. Hornby. I don't just randomly talk about him. He's very good at it. Van home, that blink went straight into the soul. I'm glad. Uh, <clears throat> think, uh, Jamie, think of them as flag class corvettes. On the face of it, second rate, but amazingly good in practice. Yep. Or if you're not happy with a flag class, there is always. Yeah, that's the one I wanted. These. And actually, this is a very good book, if you haven't read it. Uh, Castle Class. Corvettes. The slightly bigger ones than the Flower Class. And they were really very useful. You know, it's it's like the hunt class escort destroyers and all these things. These are ships which are, yeah, they're not going to fight another a six inch cruiser. That's not their role. Their role is to be the extra task group ships, the present ships. Um, Danny Freeman, do we need to call the Type Thirty One sloops? The river class corvettes and leave frigate for type three. I would spin that round. Traditionally, sloop is bigger than a corvette. Traditionally, um, so I would say sloops would be the type thirty one. Uh, I'm not sure. You see, the type thirty one corvette. Oh, it's a it's a thing. But I would say I keep the river class as. Sloops, myself. That's what I tend to call them because that's their role. Type thirty ones. Honestly, I'm tempted to call them light frig a light frigate and heavy uh, cruisers. Almost. That's really what you're talking about. You're talking about building a nearly eight thousand ton ship, which is going to go around the world, 
to be a presence asset that is, and a war you know do these things it's basically a cruiser it, it's going to be an interesting argument that one mission has any navy been dominated by one class of ship as the early burke steam to dominate today's u.s navy Not really, well, you know, you could say Age of Sail, the third rate in the Royal Navy was such a dominant ship, but they were all such individual ships, even ones which were technically in classes that, you know, you can't really say it's all the same. So, yeah, no. But it, you can understand why. It's cheaper to keep building and churning out the same thing. Is France well, the military is prone to most deadly things mission creep. Everything is prone to mission creep. <laughs> um, hobby with pizza. <laughs> the hacker of the tales of Horatio Hornblower. I'm almost tempted to ask if that is actually uh, if that question is being asked by a very certain young lady, uh, young lady naval historian, but I'm not going to ask that question. Um, how accurate tales of Horatio Hornblower? They're a good flavour of what was going on. Um, off license. I see the modern black swan idea arranging its head again in the conversation. It's always just the black swan comes up. I've written articles about the black swan concept, it's fun times. I would rules other than Hornby to come to mind. Ooh, admirals other than Hornby that come to mind. There's always one or two. Um, where is my copy of that book? Uh, hmm. Oh, there it is. Well, I'm gonna. If I'm gonna t talk about them, I'm gonna get their names right. So. Basically, you have William Parker and Geoffrey Hornby are the two who come from mine from the Royal Navy. It's going to sound strange. There are lots of other navies who have admirals going around, of course, this period, but they don't really do as much as the Royal Navy admirals in that period. So I can't really rate them in comparison. Like, just sort of, they're doing their jobs, but their jobs aren't that much. Um, George Tyrion, yeah, he's okay. Uh, night time production. Given that naval power production relies on you seeing the ships, what is the consensus of Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev push for the Soviet Navy to shift towards subs over surface ships? Uh, there is a reason he lost that argument. And I'm not sure if Carl is watching today, but a very nice gentleman, Carl, one of my Canadian viewers. has sent me this. So thank you, Carl. It's very cool of you. HMC is Haida. How to make me very happy. Driver class destroy. And there's a whole set of them. Including two of HMCS Azkaban as well. So I'm very, very happy with Carl. Thank you. I'm hoping he watches this at some point. Thank you. I will send him an email of thank you. They're very cool. Right. Uh, very useful night time production. Uh, night time production. Very useful thing subs, but they are designed to not have presence when on operations. Yep, that's the exact problem with submarines. They are very good for war fighting, not very good for everything else below that. Other than well, insertion of covert operations and reconnaissance, that sort of thing. But you know, again, that's pretty much close to war fighting edge. Uh, Tony Penfold, should we have new SSKs or more astute class? Well, we. Got the astute, so it should probably double down on them. 
I would like some Mrs. K's, but I don't think we're going to get them along with the Astutes. We need the Astutes. Night Heron Production. I'm aware the SSBN um, become the deadliest weapon platforms, but Khrushchev's decision seems to have been predated their arrival on the scene by at least four, four, four years. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Brock Payne, rediscussion of president ships. French with their Floreal class, second class frigates seem to have a really good idea. They do, they do, they have a really good idea. And it does work. They're not that great, but they do work as president ships. Carl, hello. Yes, I literally received them today. They arrived th this morning. Off license. I naval mining still considered a sea denial tactic? Yes. Yeah. Um, mine laying usually do done from the air now. So you have something like a C-130 go across and just drop all the stuff out of the air. Basically, it becomes, it's raining mines. Oh, help me. It's raining mines. Oh, help me. It's raining mines. Oh, help me. It's raining mines. Because we're not supposed to do mines on land, but mines at sea are still, you know, able to get away with, I think. Um, Jeff Beeler, what is the creation of the RN Staff College and why? So, right. The RN created a staff college in about 1890. I've been discussing this on the um, Discord recently a lot. And then the Royal Navy developed the Royal Navy War College as well at some points. And then the War College gets folded back into the Naval College at roughly, uh, roughly the end of the First World War. And then there's the Imperial Defence College appears in the interwar years. And it's all sorts of things that, you know, you have these various colleges going on. So the Royal Navy in Britain has colleges from about 1890s going forward, as we'd understand today. Mainly at Greenwich. Now, of course, the Imperial Defence College is pretty much King's College London's master's course from memory. But, you know, that could get me into trouble saying that too loud. Um, Carl Gangham, the two AFB are, yes, yeah, two different ships, World War Two and Post War. Yeah, AFB one was uh, sunk. She was. That's a, that's a sad thing, you know. She's one. She is the last tribal class destroyer to get sunk, and she's the one which actually is fairly. She takes it up to um. 13 sunk. She's the unlucky number. But she's still good. Shape 42. I wonder if part of the problem with getting modern style soups is that it's hard to explain to people holding money how useful they'll be. This is why we need to get more people reading these books and thinking about it. This is why we need to get more of this discussion. Because... I'm one of those people who honestly believes that you do not raise the level of debate by ignoring things. You raise the level of debate by engaging and conversing and giving people the tools and information to have the argument. You know, think the fence uh, that I never met him, but he does all this great tweeting and uh, tweeting and he's all these websites. And if you haven't seen it, go and have a look at him. Um, put out a point today about fantasy fleets and said, you know, one of the, uh, the fantasy fleets Things are often derided as fancy fleets because people don't have enough information to go into them. My point is that if people are so interested and so concerned about the Navy and so invested that they want to start coming with fantasy fleets, rather than shooting down saying, oh, that's not practical, it's better to go, well, that might not work, but if you can go and read this and this, and if you can go and talk to this and this, or listen to this video, or watch this discussion, or do this, you can have the information so you can refine your fantasy fleet into something which is a viable, which is good, which will work. You know, one of the things I often see when I look at fantasy fleets and sitting there going, you don't have the auxiliaries and the amphibious. Thank you, Jim. You know, you don't have all those things you need. But it's good, you know, that's what you can build in. And this is why reading these books matter. As I said, if you want to understand how, understand how the Chinese are building your fleet, you look at the first text, they get their students to read. Gosh, God, the sea power of the state. If you're looking at the Americans, I think they still do to this day, start off with Mahan. 
And the British, I'm fairly sure, start off with Corbett. So when you're talking about these navies, you talk about what's the first book? What's the book that gives them a prison from what they're going to think about? And when you're talking about fantasy fleets, when you wanted to get involved, go and do the... Re you, I often find people doing fantasy fleets are already engaged, already doing research. They just need to do a bit more to get understand the concept of why, because they're getting good, often very good on the technical detail, the ships and the capabilities, but not their things. Um, okay. <laughs> um, Primark Finone, should the mines that launch torpedoes still be called mines? Well, they technically are mines, but, you know, they're just very fun mines. Um, off license, I'd be worried about China's name and military dropping mines everywhere from fishing vessels in a war to surface. Yeah, they will, though. In the nicest way, there will be a lot of, a lot of mines dropped. Um, my uh, vision, mine laying by B-29s against Japan was seen as one of the most effective missions. Dealt huge economic transport blow, had railways been wiped, uh, planned in September. Japan would be starved by 1946. Japan would be starved earlier than that, let's be honest. Um, off license, mine laying would have been done by somewhat stealthy bombers and aircraft these days. I can't see 40, 4th Gen and Cold War bombers survive, aircraft surviving long, dropping mines without a degree of stealth. Honestly, they can do, because if you're thinking about mines in the traditional perspective, I'm looking at mines and next generation ones as pretty much versions of UUVs, that's unmanned underwater vessels. And they're going to be able to take themselves out of position, so literally, the C-130 can operate fine out of range of any, any fighters or anything, just drop them off, and then the mines will move themselves into position. Be a blooming nightmare, you won't know where the field is, just from where the aircraft's going. The whole purpose of the aircraft is just to get it closer. Jeff Beeler, why is Jeff Julian Thompson et al. pro-Brexit? You have to ask them. Um, Strub, have you ever reviewed the book Pentagon Wars? A long time ago. I don't think it's anywhere. I think my copy was nicked by someone. I think possibly my copy was nicked by one of my colleagues at King's. Uh, John Luke, what size should the RN be theoretically in terms of carrying amphibious platforms, escort subs, smaller craft, if we want to remain a major naval power and behave like one? Well, I don't see us becoming a major naval power. I, we're not going to build the same size as the United States. But if we want to remain a global power like we are now and probably add a little bit of strength onto it for emergencies and scenarios, we probably need about two aircraft carriers like we're building, two Queen Elizabeth class, three LHDs with ski ramps on, so we have five flight deck ships to call on, keep about three bay class, but use the LHDs to replace Ocean, Albion and Bulwark, even though Ocean's already gone, so you know, first one comes into service anyway. You need talking about raising the manpower from about 20,000 to about 30,000 again. And you're going to need about six six uh, destroyers, nine, frig nine ASW frigates, so you can have definitely got three escort groups available. You taught at least 10 to 12 Type 31s, 10 to 12 river classes, about 16 to 18 MCMVs, six tankers, six, you know, you know, some store ships, all these sort of things. You'll need uh, six fast tankers, six large, uh, six bigger heavy tankers, and probably about three or four store ships. All these sort of things you need. Um... Off license, anything. Uh, off license, uh, Alexander. Something you mentioned about the RN using simpler weapons and designs on their ships and planes because of the distance from the industrial base. Pretty much, yeah. Again, in nice way, Britain's looking at operating outside of the world from its industrial base, so that's why the Swordfish makes sense. It's a long-range, simple striker aircraft which can do its job at night and is easy to maintain. It makes sense. It doesn't make sense if you're looking at the high intensity scenarios which the US Navy or Japan was looking at, but if you're looking at those scenarios that Britain was looking at and how Britain wanted to fight the naval war, it makes sense. Carl Gannon, can Britain afford such a fleet? Honestly, it could. It's That stuff, most of the stuff I'm talking about is expanding on existing infrastructure already in place. 
So replacing Albion and Bulwark with free LHDs, uh, Albion, Bulwark and Ocean with free LHDs, it's going to be a slight increase. It's not, it's not what I, when I'm talking about what we would need to add on and what we're talking about, it's, it's sort of adding on enough to give the Navy what it can need to do for what the government seems to be asking for it. So basically, I, I base what I'm asking for, what I would suggest for, off what the, Navy, what the government seems to be asking the navies to do. Uh, James, the difficulty about getting a serious funding for defence is that politicians want everything done on the cheap. Everyone wants everything done on the cheap. Um, the transport. NATO has also has these deployable boys that are very powerful, active sonar, that scream into the sea. Uh, not you can use casually don't no they're not but they can wander off. We've extraordinary. What were the main lessons from Ocean Cross Swords and any other tests of nuclear weapons against ships? That you don't want to be on a ship which receives a nuclear blast. That the damage done by the movement in the water and all those things can actually do as much damage as the actual blast, and that there's a lot of complications that are caused when nuclear when you go nuclear. Gareth Salsing, it seemed like yes, hence Farragut's famous quote. Yep. Vision. My fantasy fleet is imagining what the US Navy could have built 1870 to 90 with the design, technology, and various engines and arm plate in storage from Civil War. First questions are budget and mission. Ooh, that's always good. Um, oh, tis France, well, don't remind me of nuclear sea mines. It's like nuclear depth charges. Oh, God, why? Why would anyone do that? Just the problems. And the trouble is with a nuclear mine. What happens if you set it off accidentally? <sighs> no, no. Right then. Pitron, uh, most important innovation for US Navy in was civil service reform, building a professional, honest, and competent Navy department. Yep. US Navy spent less money post-1880, but built modern ships. Yeah, that's usually the case. <laughs> uh, Ian Carr, is there significant cost savings a scope to reduce the manning of new iron ships along the lines of the new carriers? Yes, there is. They, there is going to be reduced manning on them, but it's only so far you can reduce the manning because you remember a lot of the people you have aboard the ship in are from ongoing maintenance of these things, but also are part of the damage control parties you have for if you sustain damage in, fight, in a fight. So you need a certain level of manning for that sort of scenario. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> Right, uh, it's eight o'clock, um, so I'm going to say any questions, uh, any last questions, and then I'm going to call it an evening, as we're well and truly off topic, but I think we've had a fun time, and that's always more important to me. So, any last questions? As I'm getting hungry and I can smell my tea. Literally, my sister is torturing me now because she's been. She, it was her turn to cook tonight, and I can. It's wafting up the stairs. It's shepherd's pie. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, this from a nuclear depth charge of mine would run any sub, ruin any sub for quite some distance. They would ruin everything for uh, any distance. Steam White enjoyed Taco Tuesday. Jeff Beeler, how did the Royal Navy train its admirals to be good admirals before the 1890s? <sighs> War experience. In fact, Parker is the best example of this. Um, basically, prior to 1890, you have a patronage system. So honestly. Most admirals are promoted are people who've already been patr uh, promoted because they've been good by uh, considered good by other admirals. So admirals sort of promoted up and got you know shepherd their career, 
and an admiral will uh, would get a sort of a group an entourage which would come with them on ships and officer would get ships uh who it would behove them if they were good officers because there is no space to hide on a sailing ship if you're not a good officer so that's how it was it was it was entourage system it was a sort of promotion by patronage and it looked good if you were patron if your patronage was good off were good officers so uh you tended to make sure they were good and you trained them many also many captains etc when they were taking young midshipmen etc on ship would employ schoolmasters to teach them plus as, as Stephen White's point out, exercise of the med and various things. Jeff Beeler, has your girlfriend written a book yet? She's just finishing off her PhD thesis. It's going to be done soon, and then I'm hoping she turns that into a book, because it's going to be amazing. Uh, sure, mate. Are nuclear torpedoes plagued by the same issues as depth charges of mines? Yes. Uh, this is France. Fisher had an issue that because it kept out good, capable men. Yes, it did, because... If you weren't able to impress your bosses and talk to them, you could get into trouble. But interesting enough, Fisher, of course, himself is promoted thanks to the patronage system. So Fisher gets up there because of it, but also Fisher looks around him and goes, well, these other people are idiots who have got up here because I'm presumes, of course, they're idiots because they're not him. But, you know. Um, uh, Banham, would you make a video of the list of the five ten most important books on how to understand a modern navy? Yeah, I'll do that. I've got those books. I would actually do it. I would sort of, I'd rather do that than answer Eric's question of what books do you recommend for easy reference for modern navies because I can do the modern navy stuff and do that as a video to explain those books quicker than I can, better than I can now when I'm feeling very very hungry. But basically, when I'm doing modern navy stuff, the books I tend to grab. are all out of sight at the moment because of the fact I'm doing so much stuff on the, st on the old Navy stuff at the moment. Um, when I'm doing the modern Navy stuff, I tend to have my copy of Jane and various other things around me and a lot of Warship magazines. In peace, uh, Jeff Beeler, in peacetime, you still have the exercises. Eh, you know, the thing like ballroom dancing does work for Fisher. It does. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for listening. Take care and have a nice evening. Take care. Bye. Hope you enjoyed. And see you on Thursday when it's top 10 ships. Anyone think when I was picking this week, I was making it nice and easy because I knew I was going to be finishing off editing the book. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. And that's it. Top 10 ships, not tribals, battles, darings, or town class. That was what I was set. That was the challenge I was set by engaging strategy, and I'm keeping to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Although, he didn't say no HMS Unicorn. <laughs>